So time travel has uh, really captures our imagination. I have some examples here on my title slide. We've got the poster from Back to the Future, um, this interesting painting by Salvador Dali and Marcel Duhamp, and uh, of course there's uh, Star Trek and countless science fiction media. Now, I always, in all my talks on time travel, point out this quote or something like it. This is from uh, Simon Newcomb. Aerial flight is one of the class of problems with which men will never have to cope. Um, I didn't include it in my talk, but uh, the New York Times ha in, in uh, July of 1969, you'll probably figure out why that's a significant date, had to retract a statement they wrote in 1920 saying that a rocket will never leave the Earth's atmosphere because it has nothing to push against. Oops. Hmm. So my point here is, is that even though, um, as we'll see today, that even if time travel is most likely impossible due to our best understanding of physics, our best understanding uh, has, has been wrong. So it's not just that um, a non-scientist writing an article in the New York Times, for example, has been wrong, but also uh, experts have been wrong on the feasibility of air travel and the feasibility of, of space travel. And I could have an entire talk on quotes of, of, of famous astronomers saying how space travel was nonsense and will never, and will never leave the Earth's gravity. So no, a, a talk on time travel really needs to start with Einstein's theory of special relativity. So. Einstein solved, of the many epiphanies he had and many problems he was able to solve, he saw the, the, an issue between classical physics uh, of mechanics and electromagnetism. And he was able to, we don't have time, of course, brief time together today to go through all the details. But he was able to solve and reconcile uh, some contradictory models and parts of physics by postulating that the speed of light is constant in all frames of reference. And we, especially in science fiction, like to think of that as a limitation. Oh, speed of light is not that fast when you think of intergalactic scales. But it, it results in some incredibly interesting and important mathematical consequences. And one of them is the twin paradox, which isn't really a paradox, so it's a terrible name for it because it's a real effect. And in fact, even though I'm il I illustrated with a cartoon with interstellar travel that we're not capable of yet as a species, on, the, on, this, on small scales, especially at the subatomic level, we know that the, the twin effect, as I'd prefer to call it, is real. So, the, uh, so Harold Lyons, who's the father of uh, Sherry Lyons, who's one of our organizers today, actually uh, invented the first atomic clock. You can see a um, poster of the atomic clock there and uh, a photo of Harold Lyons over there, was a, the atomic clock, which is our most precise timekeeping device, was able to demonstrate that what I'm about to tell you is an actual uh, real fact. So the classic example of the twin paradox is that you have, uh, you have two twins, and one takes a, an interstellar journey uh, to some distant star planet, close to the speed of light, turns around and comes back. And the, the, the twin who took the journey it, is uh, one that when he returns to Earth is significantly younger than his brother or sister. And this is, uh, this is a real effect that we cannot do on these large scales yet, but that thanks to atomic clocks and very fast planes, we can show that indeed this is a real effect and that time is plastic. We talked a lot about, we talked about neuroplasticity t today. We all have this intuition that time is absolute, but that is shattered um, by Einstein and relativity. Time is not absolute, and your time and my time do not flow at the exact same rate. It's not like the universe has a universal timepiece, and every star and planet has a clock ticking at, some, at the same rate. So if we take this now, and so if this is a question now of engineering and technology, not of physics. So this is, if we had the fuel, probably something better than fossil fuels to do interstellar travel, this is guaranteed to work. But now, this is maybe not as 
uh, satisfying. This is time travel to the future one way. Because your, 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 your uh, uh, contemporary friends or your dis you may uh, outlive your descendants by taking an interstellar trip, coming back to Earth. But that's a one-way trip to the future. Now let's try to, if we try to do some mathematical extrapolations in relativity to see, well, what can we do to get to the past? So if we mathematically extrapolate that as you approach the speed of light, we know that time slows down in some sort of, it's an ill-defined sense, but at the speed of light, time stops. Then if we extrapolate that, ah, faster than the speed of light should mean time goes in reverse. Unfortunately, though, you would need an infinite amount of energy to push anything with non-zero mass to, to the speed of light itself, let alone to exceed it. So that doesn't seem to be something practical or realistic in any way. So now let's expand, though, from special relativity to Einstein's other great epiphany, which was general relativity, where he essentially rewrote Newton's theory of gravity to have a come up with a completely different theory of gravity that explains gravity in a different way through gravity being the geometry of space-time and not just some mysterious force. And recently, this year's you know, Nobel Prize in Physics was awarded for the discovery of gravitational waves, which is an astounding um, additional upon other existing mountains of evidence of the, of the predictive power of uh, uh, general relativity and how it accurately explains the world around us. If we look at general relativity, uh, you can come up with something known as a uh, Tipler cylinder. So this is another attempt at trying to get some, something um, that gets us time travel to the past. And the idea here is, is you have a very dense material and that if it's rotating fast enough and the material is dense enough, this twists space-time in a way that traveling around the cylinder in space uh, should get, um, get you back in time. You can think of this, a good analogy is a spiral staircase. So we're all taught that if you, if you walk around 360 degrees, you return to the same point. Try that on a spiral staircase. You do not return to the same point. The idea here is, is that with a spinning cylinder, with the, you can set up the right space-time geometry that gets space-time twisting such that if you execute 360 degrees spatially, you return to a different point in time, including the past. The problem with this is, is well, how would you get a material that's dense enough and one of the main issues pointed out by Stephen Hawking is that for any of these types of ideas, you would need either an infinitely long cylinder or you'd need something called negative energy, basically matter that would have, a, uh, would have negative mass instead of positive, which I'll come back to later. So it doesn't look like warping space-time is going to work. We have these infeasible obstacles, infinite length. How are you going to make something infinitely long? Although I think the uh, size of the universe would, would work too. So if the universe isn't infinite, you can get around this. What if instead of trying to twist space-time, you try to punch a hole through it? So this is the very classic. Here's a picture of the, uh, the, uh, the idea of a wormhole where you can punch a hole through space-time and you get from one distant location to another or even another universe or hopefully even better to a point in the past or future. And the, uh, this is just a cartoon the classic example of this is you take a sheet of paper or you poke a hole through it to point out how what, what if you could have a shortcut through space-time. I should point out this is only a cartoon since we have three spatial dimensions. They got this right in the movie Interstellar. A wormhole would actually be a sphere, not a 2D hole like we're used to in, in the book. So this is just an analogy because I can't uh, give you a four-dimensional uh, pr uh, projection in PowerPoint. That, that'll be in a future version. So... <laughs> And there's a, the problem with wormholes, this is a great idea, and you can write down the equations for this in general relativity. And as I said before, we believe general relativity. We discovered gravitational waves. We saw more this week. And uh, your, your GPS needs relativistic corrections from both special and general relativity as we co communicate with satellites that are traveling fast and are far from the Earth's gravitational field. But these, uh, the equations of general relativity tell us that, unfortunately, a wormhole would be unstable. Even a laser pointer, even light attempting to traverse the wormhole would collapse it. Uh, you need 
something with negative mass, or at least negative mass squared, to go through, which is known as the, uh, the tachyon particle, the hypothetical particle that's always traveling faster than the speed of light. And so this, again, runs into uh, this issue of negative mass. Seems to be a running theme of something we need for time travel. And I'm going to now explain why that appears to be the case. So this is a classic a, uh, cartoon that's used to illustrate um, it with a 2D analogy of our, of our uh, three dimensions of space, what the, um, how general relativity describes gravity in the universe. So bodies with mass, the Earth, the Sun, will make dents in space-time. The more massive an object is, the, the more significant the dent. So our, the Earth orbits the sun not because there's this, as, um, there's this mysterious action at a distance that Isaac Newton would call it, but because there's this invisible manifold of space-time that's being warped. And if you have enough uh, velocity, you fall around something instead of into it. But if we keep extrapolating and extrapolating, we get from the Earth to the Sun to entire clusters of galaxies which are, have enough gravitational field to actually bend light. The Sun does as well, of course, and even the Earth, but it's a much smaller effect. But if we keep going to black holes, this is a picture from the movie Interstellar, then if we keep extrapolating in the classical... Uh, theory of general relativity, there comes a point where at the, at the event horizon of a black hole, the point of no return beyond which even light can't escape, if you, if you throw something into a black hole to an external observer, it would be as if time had stopped. So the extrapolation here, similarly to the extrapolation with speed, that as you approach the speed of light, time slows down and stops. If we do this with gravity, in general, instead of special relativity, as gravity goes to infinity, time slows down to the point of stopping. Now, again, though, time is relative. If you're falling into the black hole, you don't freeze at the border. You fall in and die. Okay, so this is the external observer. So someday, I think it would be a lot of fun to just park next to a black hole and throw stuff at it and create this ring of frozen objects that appear frozen in time. Again, though, from the object's perspective, it falls in and, and is crushed in the singularity, most likely, according to our current best understanding. Now, let's, um, let's look at a more recent, so we've, I, we talked about the Tipler cylinder and the, and the twin paradox. These are all go back decades. I want to talk about a more um, recent thinking on this topic going in a, a different direction, although still following um, one of the earlier themes of rotation. One was negative energy and the other was a need for somehow twisting space-time. And so uh, a colleague of mine, Professor Ron Mallett at University of Connecticut Stores, um, whom I met when I was giving a colloquium at, uh, at University of Connecticut on my, research into, um, a, on my research into dark matter, he's actually the only real life experimental physicist who's not a crackpot, real tenured professor, although my, um, my colleagues always say being a professor of PhD does not guarantee you're not a crackpot, but he's a, he's a real deal. And he's got a new idea that he came up with only, uh, I believe it was a decade ago now, to, uh, to, create a, a time, a, in a, to create an effect by which you could travel to the past using, his, he has a completely new idea of how to attack this problem. This is uh, a photo of him with one of his prototypes. It's not photoshopped. It's a real device. It doesn't take you to the past yet, but, but this is a real device, and I'm going to explain to you how this works. The uh, uh, Dr. Mallet's idea is that you produce a cylinder of laser light, and the you you use mirrors or something like that, you know, to create a circulating laser, so that's confined to uh, to a spiral essentially along a cylinder. And the idea is is that if the laser is strong enough, you should be able to send something in on one side, send a particle in on one side, and emerges on the other side of the cylinder in the past. Because if the laser light is strong enough, it's like, it's like this animation here of swirling a cup of coffee. Space and time itself is rotated. And on a small scale, this also, just like the twin effect and the gravitational slowing of time, this is a real 
effect we've, that we've measured, we've measured, it's called frame dragging from the earth. This is just extrapolating this on steroids. Now, um, it remains to be seen, does this really, there, uh, Dr. Mel, of course, been arguing with his, his, discussing with his colleagues, would it need to be infinitely long to work? Does it still need, uh, does it need negative energy? So the last topic I'm going to, to, to hit, so these are all the examples of ideas of what we can do, um, and a lot of these are from relativity, but let's think also about uh, quantum mechanics, which is, so relativity tells us about gravity and about speed, with the speed of light, but there's also a whole other area of physics that explains the world of the very small, that explains particle physics, and that's quantum mechanics. In quantum mechanics, we can try to attack the question of whether time travel is possible, looking at particles, a proton, an electron, or a photon traveling, what if it interacts with itself in the past? What does that even mean if it prevents its own trajectory through a wormhole, for example? And that's a variation on things like the grandfather a paradox about breaking it down into, into subatomic particles. So time travel, if it is allowed, we would need to under we need a full theory of physics combining our understanding of quantum mechanics and relativity to get a full answer as to whether it's possible or not. Right now, we don't have um, we a uh, we don't have one simple set of equations we can write down that explains the entire universe, including gravity and particle physics, all at once. There are if time travel is possible, I can't give a, a talk on on that topic without mentioning. Uh, Paradoxes. My favorite, though, is I think even more complicated than you know killing one of your ancestors or a particle bumping into itself in the past. But there's the ontological paradox. So here we see um, Calvin trying to steal his homework from himself so he doesn't have to do it. So if time travel is possible, it leads to this serious issue of information without a source which in quantum mechanics is a very serious problem. We, how can we, if, if time travel's real, forget about the paradoxes of, you know, of, killing, your, of, 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 of killing one of your ancestors, um, either by accident or on purpose, but because, what happens if you have objects or ideas without an origin that are essentially closed loops? So this is very, very, um, very, very bizarre. So, uh, one solution um, by a, a physicist, David Deutsch, is that you've, you've probably heard of the solution of parallel universes. Oh, it's no time, there are no paradoxes, you just make another timeline. Another explanation is predestination. If you try to assassinate Hitler, your gun will always jam. Personally, I think that's a lousy explanation. It's not intellectually satisfying. Then there's a third explanation that's not explored very often, not even in fiction because it's so bizarre, and that is the idea that if you, if you did try to create a paradox, the universe becomes a Mobius strip, and you have two timelines existing simultaneously. And so if you go back in time and kill your grandfather or your mother, you become, you're both dead and alive. At like Schrodinger's cat, you're fifty percent dead, fifty percent alive. What does that even mean, though? And that's that's a difficult question since quantum mechanics is about particles. We are collections of vast numbers of particles, ten to a very large number, and so it's not clear what the what these what the eerie quantum effects mean for large collections of of atoms like ourselves. So all of these ideas, parallel universes. Um, and, uh, and this predestination paradox are explored in fiction all the time. We've got The Flash, Twilight Zone, Star Trek, things like that. Every so often we have supposedly real life evidence of time travel that's always really easy to debunk though, such as the infamous cell phone in, in the Charlie Chaplin movie, The Circus, um, which was very easily explained away um, as, a, as an uh, uh, earpiece for, uh, for the hearing impaired. So these are usually pretty easy to debunk. We don't have any um, really uh, robust evidence that there are time travelers among us. Um, except, of course, there's uh, the composer Gustav Mahler who looks exactly like me. So I actually, in fact, I, I fooled my wife with that one on Facebook. She said, how did you get a Daguerre-type photo of yourself? That's amazing. And I was like, uh, that's not me. All right, so um, 
Tourists from the future, though, are always brought up by Stephen Hawking and Neil deGrasse Tyson, who I hope see this on YouTube. I hope I catch their attention because I, the humble professor from UAlbany, I'm going to tell them that they're wrong about something very important. So I'm going to boldly declare that time travel is not disproven by a lack of tourists from the future. And the reason is easy. And in fact, since I'm not an expert in general relativity, they are. They should know because in general relativity, it's very easy to show that, for example, wormholes is a classic example of this. You can't, even if time travel is real, you can't go back before you made the machine. So if I use a wormhole, for example, time travel, the day that I punch the wormhole, that's the first day I can go back to from the future to that day. I can't go back further than the past, then the moment I created the machine or phenomenon. There are exceptions, of course, what if there's naturally occurring wormholes that have been around since the, big, since the beginning of time, things like that. But in general, I'm not worried about the lack of tourists from the future because um, it just means time travel hasn't been invented yet. So I don't see a problem with that. So in conclusion, the problems we have with time travel based on our current understanding of physics are unfortunately numerous. You need to go faster than light, build a device of infinite length, use negative energy or infinite energy. You would need something gravitationally, um, uh, gravitationally repulsive if we extrapolate, as I was talking about, how um, increasing gravity slows time down and gets you to the future. To get to the past, you'd need something that we, we don't know exists and we don't even have a model or hypothesis that predicts any sort of particle or material with the requisite type of negative energy. So I'm going to conclude that it's unlikely that a human will ever travel through time, at least into the past, with a fine-tunable machine with an on-off switch like we want in, in fiction. However, I will make the bold optimistic prediction that once we've figured out how to marry relativity and quantum mechanics and we have a full fury of everything, that I think that time travel will be possible for subatomic particles. So that it'll be possible to communicate, for example, have some sort of time telephone or telegraph. And I'm gonna boldly predict with no, nothing to back this claim up, but that within 100 years, we'll get to the point where we have the technology to send a subatomic particle a tiny fraction of a second into the past, not carrying any useful information initially. Now, in order for that to be feasible, though, Time travel would have to be taken seriously, which it isn't, um, and no one uh, would, would actually be working on it other than, other than Ron Mallet. Um, I don't know of anyone else who's really taking it seriously in terms of experimental physicists. There are many theoretical physicists who do write um, papers on it, who work on general relativity, but I don't know um, other, th other than... Um, Ron Mallet, I don't know anyone else who's taking it seriously enough to try to build something. And I think in order for my optimistic prediction to come true, it would have to be taken seriously and pursued by large numbers of the brightest minds in order for even in 100 years, even for my... my I, this prediction is way too optimistic for my colleagues, but people... Um, but in general, nine, nine scientists say, no, that's not good enough. What do you mean subatomic particles? I want to get in the time machine. And so um, I'm going to conclude with this. Uh, every, a lot of what I talk about today wouldn't be possible, obviously, with Einstein's uh, uh, seminal work. And, uh, and I, I always throw out this photo of Einstein because we've got to remember that uh, he didn't always have gray hair. You know, he was born, he was a baby, and he, he, there was a point in which he did not have gray hair yet. So I always like throwing out that image. So that's all I've got. Thank you.